Today's video is brought to you by Curiosity Stream. More on them in just a bit. Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Casual Criminalist. As always, I am your host, Simon. Welcome to the show. What happens here? One of my writers, in this case, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. Writes me a script that I've uh, never read before. It's called A Cold Read. We're going to read it together, explore the Philippines' most controversial murder trial, the Cheong Sisters. Uh, Kevin pitched this to me via email, and I was like... Kevin, this sounds like children are going to get murdered. And he's like, that's not that's not the main drift of the story. The main drift of the story is apparently the trial and what went wrong with it and all of that stuff. And I was like, okay. Because immediately I was like, dude, please, no more killing children. I've had enough. I th it was a while ago now. But I remember just recording something. And I was like, I, I, I don't want to do that right now, Kevin. I need a break. Um, but he persuaded me otherwise. So, yeah, we're going to go into it. Hopefully... It's not going to be too horrible. The world breathes with relief. I'm feeling better than I was last week when I think Kevin pitched this to me because that was a rough week. I think I recorded like three casual criminalists and they were all fairly dark. And I was like, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> please, iced Kevin. Anyway, uh, I'm going to read it. Enough blathering. Jen, afterwards, our wonderful video editor, nah, yo, hold my poodle. Hold my poodle. Uh, does the magic with the music and the uh, the video, obviously. I can't speak for the rest of the world, though I suspect the sentiment is quite similar, but here in America, Amazon is seen as an evil corporation that uses dirty tactics to crush small businesses and savagely mistreat its employees, forcing warehouse workers to relieve themselves in empty boxes while they're at work because there's simply no time for them to take a bathroom break. Despite this, we still use Amazon, because what's the alternative? Going to the mall? Yeah, this is, this is something that does bother me. It's like, obviously, I don't like, uh having employees have to pee in boxes or whatever uh, allegedly or whatever but also when people complain about this and then i'm like do you shop at amazon and they're like yeah i shop at amazon i'd really like them to get this shit together it's like okay why do you shop at amazon well it gets to be fast and it's the cheapest and i'm like well how do you think they can do that it's the cons if we really if you were really that bothered by it otherwise you'd, you'd stop shopping at amazon and you'd pay more for worse service el elsewhere other than that, it's just virtue signal, isn't it? So how about if you shop at Amazon, you shut your mouth about how Amazon uh, treat their employees and run their business? Because you're not even taking the most basic action towards stopping that, which is stopping to shop at Amazon. Like this, uh, I'm recording this, so this will go out way later because we're so far ahead on this, but Ukraine is invaded by Russia. And all of these companies are like international companies pull out of russia as you know part of a sanction and some of them do it the early ones probably out of the goodness of their hearts they're like that's out <laughs> out of the goodness of their hearts do companies ever do that probably not but look mcdonald's they were there for a little bit longer than everyone else and then people were like well i'm just not gonna eat some mcdonald's am i until you pull out of russia and that is consumer action getting a giant corporation to give up nine percent of their global revenue by pulling out of russia because if ten percent of the rest of the world just ten percent are like well i'm not gonna be and even i was like i'm not just there's a burger king right next door to the mcdonald's and i'll just eat their mcdonald's because it's not that hard is it how about you pull out of russia and um what was i talking about yeah consumers take action if you're not ha happy about something this is uh, such a massive rant but it does piss me off when people shop at amazon but complain about amazon or any company the mall sucks and their strict policy of requiring pants doesn't vibe with my modern shopping sensibilities with the convenience and ease of online shopping malls becoming a relic of the past may very well be in our foreseeable future the narrative was quite a bit different in the 1990s however online shopping barely existed and the general public was still a bit leery of it back then malls were the place to be the variety of stores meant you could do all of your shopping in one stop teens would go there just to hang out or for employment the elderly would come by every morning to get their daily exercise these days these days malls are becoming a relic of a bygone era they were once hustling hubs of commerce and socialization though well for most people the worst thing that could happen at the mall was that the wetzel's pretzels ran out of your favorite dipping sauce sisters mara joy and jacqueline jong were not so lucky their last trip to the mall was the last time that anyone would see either of them alive maybe do we have a conspiracy in today's episode like maybe they're dead oh i like i mean i like that i like the idea that if they've been murdered they could still be alive because that's nice the kidnapping 
Mara Joy, 21, and Jacqueline, 23, were born to parents Dionioso and Thelma Chiong. They grew up on the island of Cebu in the Philippines. Dionioso worked for a trucking company, and the girls had part time jobs working at the mall. Okay, so for some reason, they're not children, they're, they're young adults. Um, I don't know why I had it in my mind they were children when I was communicating with Kevin. I think I just briefly looked at the Wikipedia page and, I don't know, maybe misread something. On the night of the 16th of July 1997, Marajoy and Jacqueline had finished their shifts at the Ayala Mall. They were outside the mall in a waiting shed, waiting for their ride to arrive. What is a waiting shed? <laughs> Who waits in a shed? When they were late to return home from work, Selma would send her two sons to retrieve them, thinking that the girls must have had trouble getting a ride because it was such a rainy and stormy night. Then the boys, who's giving them a ride? They're just like, ah, I hope someone comes pick us up. <laughs> just on a whim? When the boys arrived at the mall, the girls were already gone, but they were never to return home. According to signed witness statements, a white car had pulled up to the waiting shed at 10 p.m. and two uh, two men forced the girls inside. There was a red car trailing this one with five more men in it. The white car drove about 14 meters before Jacqueline jumped out of it. She was chased down and forced back into the car. Once inside, she was elbowed in the chest and Mara Joy was punched in the stomach. The respective blows caused both girls to faint, at which point they were handcuffed to one another and packing tape was placed over their mouths. Simon, I know I promised you this episode wasn't going to be too brutal. Yeah, Kevin, we had a discussion about this. So I guess for the next few minutes, you should let your mind zone out or just think happy thoughts. Just try to think about happy thoughts. Yeah, but then I can't comment and I can't discuss it when we get into the rest of the episode and I can't espouse how much I can't wait for the people who committed this crime to suffer. And this is the Philippines. I got the feeling this is one of those countries where they'll still like hang people for bad crimes, which is nice. I mean, I guess the feeling. I say that now, and I'm like, why are you saying that? And then I'll probably ne read the next few paragraphs and then be like, oh yeah, that's why. Good. The cars left the mall and headed to a safe house in Guadalupe, Cebu City. The girls were brought inside to separate rooms, but after about 15 minutes, the girls and their seven captors returned to their vehicles. Marajo and Jacqueline were again handcuffed together, and they headed to the bus terminal where they were able to rent a van and abandon the red car. They then proceeded south, stopping to get some barbecue and tandoi rum before arriving at Tanawan, south of Cebu City. The group parked their van and white car near a ravine and proceeded to enjoy their barbecue and rum as well as smoke some weed. Growing up in the 1980s, I was always warned that marijuana was a gateway drug, but no one warned me that it was a gateway to murder. Then again, marijuana use is punishable by life in prison under the, in the Philippines under the Dangerous Drugs Act of 1972. Holy sh That makes that... What's that? Is it the three-strike policy in the US? Where it's like, if you commit three minor... Is this still a thing? I can't believe this is still a thing. If it is, what's going on, America? Uh, where if you get caught for three minor crimes, they put you in prison for, like, life or something? I mean, not, like, speeding. But, like, I think marijuana possession was one of those. And it's like, oh my god, so if you get caught with marijuana three times, you go to prison for life. I'm not sure if that's actually true. Now I'm saying it, it sounds so absurd that surely it can't be true. Yeah, okay, I just looked it up real quick. And apparently, three strikes laws generally mandate a life sentence for the third violation of violent felonies. So, uh, that, that makes more sense to me, because then it's like, well, uh, you know, a run of violent behavior. Um, still, I'm not sure that's such a good idea. We should just punish people per crime, not for, like, ongoing crimes. And obviously, if they're arrested a third time for the same crime they've committed twice before, it's going to be a lot easier. Maybe give them a, a longer sentence, but putting them away for life for three violent crimes seems pretty insane because a violent crime could be punching someone in the face that's a crime it's violent but if i punch three people in the face at different occasions it just means i'm a fighter it doesn't mean i deserve to go to prison for the rest of my life so perhaps they were of the same mindset as a murderer who continues killing on the basis that the penalty is the same for a hundred murders as it is for one so why not <laughs> insane logic the gang of seven men now out of their minds on rum and dangerous drugs pulled jacqueline out of the car and instructed her to dance as they encircled her she was pushed from one end of the circle to the other as the men ripped her clothes while this was happening one of the men in the circle went inside the van that still had mara joy inside he returned 15 minutes later asking who wants next one by one all seven men took turns inside the van raping mara joy um kevin Kevin, you promised me a lack of horrible stuff. And I know you said I had to skip the next few paragraphs, but dude. 
She was then carried out of the van and Jacqueline was forced back inside. There was only time for three of the men to have their way with her. When the third man returned, Marajoy was unceremoniously pushed down into the 150 meter deep ravine. The impact from the fall would have killed her instantly. Jacqueline was thrown to the ground and as she tried to get up and run to the road, the gang taunted her following her in the van. A passing tricycle, the most common form of motorized transportation in the Philippines, due to costing less than $2,000, was seen coming down the road, so Jacqueline was pulled inside and beaten unconscious. What happened to her afterwards is unaccounted for. Well, maybe. The tricycle driver, thinking that the passengers in the van had been throwing garbage off of the cliff, wrote down the license plate number. A woman named Annie, who lived nearby, also signed an affidavit stating that she saw the suspicious white car parked by the ravine. Two days later, the decomposing body of a young woman was found at the bottom of the ravine. She had been beaten, blindfolded, handcuffed, and gang raped. Dionosio and Thelma identified the body was that of their daughter Marajoy. The Chiong Seven Francisco Juan Laranga, nicknamed Paco, was a 17-year-old dual citizen of Spain and the Philippines. He came from a privileged family and was studying at the Center for Culinary Arts in Quezon City, some 300 miles from the island of Cebu. Two months after the murders, he was approached on campus by armed men in plain clothes claiming to be police officers. He called his sister Mimi, who heroically rushed to the scene and dispatched the officers on the condition that Paco would go to Cebu the next day and be questioned. Wait, how does his sister... Why does his sister have such authority over the police? What? When he arrived in Cebu, Paku was arrested along with six other men who would go on to be known as the Cheong Seven. The other six men arrested were Yos Wajosman, Asna, Rowan Adelawan, aka Wesley, Alberto Cao, aka Alan Pahak, Ariel Balansang, James Anthony Oi, aka Wang Wang, and James Andrew Oi, aka MM. Almost all of these men came from well-off families and all had records on the juvenile registry for minor altercations. Paco's record included one not-so-minor altercation, which was one of the reasons he was singled out. Paco was accused of attempting to abduct a first-year high school student from the University of San Carlos Girls High School the year prior. That is not... <laughs> to describe trying to kidnap a child as a not-so-minor altercation is uh, putting it mildly, Kevin. Note that this is all allegedly as there was no arrest or charges brought forth on the matter, but there was a letter dated 25th of September 1996 from the parents of the girl to the student affairs office of the high school. Seems like more should have been done about that, maybe. The public couldn't have been happier with the arrest. I'm happy. Nah. The they were all seen as thugs from privileged families, the, the types of people who are generally regarded as acting and perhaps in fact being above the law, especially in the case of Paco who was seen as the leader of the gang and from the most privileged family. So the idea that justice could actually be served was tantalizing to the people of Cebu, and they anxiously awaited the trial in the hopes that the Cheong Seven would not simply buy their way out of trouble, as wealthy people are always believed to do. I mean, it's insane. It's it would be an insane statement to say like the wealth people of you know don't get away with more crimes. Obviously, they they could afford like better lawyers and stuff. But are we talking about like bribery here? Are they going to be able to like bribe their way out of prison? Because if you do like major crimes, no matter like what's that? Um, the guy uh, Robert Durst, who was just convicted. Oh, he died. Did he? He died, right after not being in prison very long. He had like COVID or something. Um, but he was convicted of those murders. And he was a billionaire, or at least like hundreds of millions, right? And it's like, yo, if you commit murders and stuff, you're not that, you know, you're much less likely to get away with that, no matter how good your lawyers are. Although Robert Durst admitted to it onto a hot mic, which was insane. What a great story. The Eighth Man and the Trial of the Century. The people of the Philippines saw this as the trial of the century, anxiously awaiting to see if justice could win out over wealth and privilege. The trial of the Cheong Sentence centered primarily on two people. The first was Peiko. Peiko was seen as the leader of the gang and the one who supposedly had the strongest alibi for the crime. The prosecution felt that if they could prove his guilt, then the other convictions would be trivial. Likewise, the defense felt that if they could defend Peiko's innocence, the prosecution case would fall apart. The other centerpiece of the trial was co-defendant Davidson Valiente Rusia. 
He turned himself in as the eighth member of Pecos gang and agreed to testify against the other members. He was the prosecution's star witness. Rusia said that he was told to meet the group at the mall at 10 p.m. for a big happening. He assumed this meant that they were just going to party or something, but went on to explicitly detail the abductions that began at the mall and ended with the murder at the ravine. His testimony lasted for days, but Pecos' lawyers only questioned him on cross-examination for 30 minutes. Eventually, unable to find any reasonable defense, Pecos' lawyers quit the case and he was assigned lawyers from the public defender's office. Unsurprisingly, they did not fare any better. Wow. When your expensive lawyers quit because they're like, yeah, we're not going to be able to manage this, so you have to go with the default government lawyer. The default government lawyer is just going to be like, ah, oh, f***. Yeah. Mate. You're screwed, and you shall remain screwed. Uh, Rusia's version of events were recreated in a short film that aired on national television. After watching the actors who played Rowan and Ariel high five each other after pushing Marajoy off a cliff, the nation knew that these men were guilty and wanted to see them executed. What the f are you doing, national television? Why are you making a movie about this? Like, I'm all for these guys going to prison or being executed if this actually, if they are guilty beyond all of, uh, beyond all reasonable doubt. And I, I don't know if they have juries in the Philippines, but even <clears throat> like. Even if it's a judge system where the judge decides, um, that is going to bias the population, which is going to bias. It's just going to bias everything. You can't make a video of these two guys high fiving after committing a murder. That's insane. On the 5th of May 1999, after three months of deliberation, Cebu Regional Trial Court Judge Martin Acampo finally wrote his decision. He declared that all eight defendants were guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Bruce Hewitt granted blanket immunity for his role as a star witness, while the other seven men were all sentenced to two life sentences. The mandatory penalty for murder at the time was the death penalty, but Acampo ruled that because he was not sure the body found in the ravine was Marajoy Chong, that they could not say for certain that a murder took place. Wait, didn't the parents identify it as Marajoy? So what the hell? The men were instead convicted of two counts of kidnapping and illegal detention. Dionisio and Thelma were furious, of course, uh, deeming that anything less than death was unsuitable justice. Also, did the judge just f***ing say that that might not even be Marajoy's body and there might have not been a murder? Is that not somehow important? Yes, that feels important, and I feel like, judge, what the f*** are you up to? Did you not pay attention during this case? Are you listening to a word I'm saying? Also, I'm with the parents on this one. Hang these guys. <laughs> This is like, I know, ongoing debate about my opinions on the death penalty, but I mean, if I was these parents and this was my kid, hang him. An eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. And I'm like, well, f that and f you. Kill these guys. Later, guys, you've heard me talk about Curiosity Stream before. If you haven't, then you're probably brand new to this channel. And in that case, I'm going to tell you about Curiosity Stream. Yay! Why is it? I, I don't know why I said that with like not quite like true enthusiasm Cur I, I guess <laughs> yay it's too much the curiosity stream is legitimately amazing uh, what do i have to say about this oh i love what they're i love their how they phrase it netflix for nerds hulu for history buffs disney plus for the scientist in us this is the only ad copy where they're like you could actually use the name of competitors Every everyone else there's always a big thing saying do not mention competitors do not the curiosity stream they're like you know what? I think we can do it. I think people will realize we're better value. We've got loads of stuff. It's like it is for it's just people who love documentaries and learning stuff. That's what Curiosity Stream is. And the pricing, I know I should mention this at the end, but it's so absurd. I'm going to mention it up front. $14, you get 25% off with my code, which I'll give you in a bit. Chill. Uh, and it makes it $14.99 for the whole year. And I know I'm pretty sure, at least, I pay more than that for, like, 4K Netflix, or whatever it is. I pay more than that for a whole bunch of things that I subscribe to per month. And CuriosityStream is that much for the whole year. And it's filled with stuff. What do I What do I recommend? Oh, yeah, okay, this is Casual Criminals. This is my true crime show. I would recommend Crime Scene Solvers. Um, that is an ongoing... It's like a docu-series where each month... Or is what? I say each month, <laughs> like they schedule it live, 5 p.m. on Friday. No, no, no. It's like the, all the stuff's uploaded there. <laughs> They're adding new stuff each month. That's what I meant to say. Uh, and it's this French show, but it's all like remade. Like it's not dubbed, but it's like, you know, that documentary thing where they've replaced the narration. They've done all of this. So it's crime cases that you haven't heard about before or you're much less likely to have heard about before. And they're awesome. And it just seems like it's made in English because it's so well done. 
And yeah, you're just like, wow, France is scary. <laughs> it's like, what do you think? I think of France. I think of like food and wine. And now I just think of, oh my God, you have weird crimes, France. What's up with that? It's called Crime Scene Solvers. Check it out, Curiosity Stream. Additional talking points. Okay. First streaming service addressing our lifelong quest to learn, explore, and understand. Yeah, it's just all content for smart people. It's available on many platforms. There's a huge list. But look, if you've got a screen of a device that was made in the last, I don't know, five years, six years, ten, I don't know, a long time, you're going to be able to watch it. It's available worldwide uh, and content spans... Well, all the smart people stuff, science, nature, technology, history, society, and lifestyle. Society and lifestyle, I feel like, could <laughs> not necessarily be super smart. But I don't watch that stuff on Curiosity Stream because I've got such a big brain. Uh, okay, so go to curiositystream.com slash criminalist for unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and non-fiction titles. And for you guys, use the promo code criminalist and you'll save 25% off, which comes to only $14.99 a year. I already mentioned like a million times. Again, the code is criminalist. Address is curiositystream.com slash criminalist. There's a link below for your convenience. Sign up, support the show, you won't regret it. It's killer. Ah, ah, get that killer because it's a crime show. Clever. And uh, let's get back to the show. Context clues. Jesus Christ, where do we even begin with this complete and total sh show? Well, to understand everything that happened, there's some important context to this trial that I've omitted thus far. I mentioned that the accused were predominantly from privileged families, and that is true. The public wanted proof that even the wealthy were not above the law, as is often perceived to be the case. Well, they didn't get the death penalty, so they got away with that, and it seems like through a very bizarre... And when something really odd happens in something, like when you know, a contract goes really strangely to one company rather than another, or a judge or a jury make a really bizarre decision. The first thing I want to leap to is like, who paid who? Who threatened who? What exactly is going on here? Because this doesn't seem like a sensible decision. And I'm immediately jumping to like, what's up with that judge? What's that judge up to? Why did he say that thing about maybe there's not been a murder? Judgey judge. Has someone lined your pockets? Allegedly. How convenient. The public wants to prove that even the wealthy were not above the law, as is often perceived to be the case. Yes, I know, Simon, that's perceived to be the case because it absolutely is the case. However, the one thing that can see justice or some perverted semblance of it done against a privileged family is an even more privileged family. By all accounts, the Cheongs were not particularly wealthy. Their daughters were working part-time at a mall after all. However, they had connections. I also... I don't know. I'm fairly privileged, and I want my kids to go and work jobs. I'm not just going to give them money so they don't have to work. I think it's good for development. People are like, why are you working at the mall? Isn't your family rich? I'd be like, yeah, they're rich. <laughs> I'm not. I need money. I think it's good character building. Thelma's sister was the personal secretary to Joseph Estrada, who became President Joseph Estrada near the beginning of the trial. Oh, oh that's a connection. He was inaugurated on June the 30th, 1998. Also, there's the trucking company that Dionisio worked for. He had actually been the manager of the entire trucking company before leaving. That trucking company was owned by Peter Lim, a notorious alleged drug lord that was put on red notice by Interpol in March of 2019 and is the subject of an international manhunt. Holy sh**. These guys are connected to both the highest level of office and also a very seemingly dangerous criminal. I learned about red notices from that uh, Ryan Reynolds and, um, oh god, the woman who pay played, uh, oh god, what's her name? The Israeli woman and uh, The Rock. Such a good laugh. It's a Netflix movie, uh, Red Notice, and it's all about Interpol, this Red Notice or whatever. It's fun. But what I learned from that is a red notice from Interpol is a serious thing. Like, that means, like, all the police are looking for you. <laughs> a fun fact that is completely unrelated to the story at hand and definitely couldn't have any bearing on anything is that Dionysio was set to testify against his former boss before the Congressional Committee on Dangerous Drugs at the time his daughters went missing. Oh my. Oh my. This guy is brave. Like, you're gonna testify against a drug lord? I don't want to sound like a coward. I mean, I do. I don't care. There's no way if I worked for a drug lord and they were like, do you want to testify against him? I'd be like, what drug lord? <laughs> Who's a drug lord? I don't know anything about any drug lords. Also, un 
Not because I'm afraid of death. I mean, I absolutely am because I don't want them murdering my family. I've seen Sicario. F*** that movie. I saw it like 10 years ago. I still think about it. Don't testify against drug lords. If you have a family or care about your life. Or are just a coward. <laughs> This is especially important for a few reasons. The first is Pecos attempted arrest on campus. While he was terrified and confused, his sister Mimi was a f***ing legend. When she arrived on the scene after Pecos phone call, she immediately noticed that all the men had expired police IDs and did not have any sort of warrant for Pecos, so she basically told the multiple armed men to f*** right off even if Pecos did agree to return to Cebu the next day. Those men were later identified as thugs under the employee of the alleged drug lord. Oh my god, that guy was gonna get killed that's so intense that's what so i was wondering how he she he didn't get arrested how he just left because uh, they were fake police oh my lord don't testify against drug lords based on the timing of the girl's disappearances and the reputation of peter lim the red notice guy there is a lot of speculation that the cheong seven were targeted because their families had somehow upset lim one of the major details supporting this theory is that only two of the members of the supposed gang had ever met each other before the trial and none of them had ever met star witness and co-conspirator rusia that is, if you choose to take the word of a group of now convicted felons. Peiko also claims that he never met Marajoy or Jacqueline before either, though their mother claims that he had been dating and harassing Marajoy. But who are you going to believe, a convicted murderer or a grieving mother? Don't answer yet, because now that, is, now that the stage is more properly set, it's time to re-examine the trial. The Mistrial of the Century as a quick side note, the Philippines does not have jury trials. All criminal matters are decided by a judge. Just wanted to clear that one up for our US and UK listeners who may have found themselves wondering about the lack of a jury. Yeah, juries, I mean, for like a murder in the UK, pretty sure it's always going to be a jury trial. I know in the US you have juries for, you have juries for like civil crimes, which blows, it just seems crazy to me. Like, it's every, every like, you know, someone suing someone and you have a jury. That's what you have judges for. It's not like anyone's having their freedom impinged upon. <laughs> Just have a judge decide it real quick. You have lawyers fighting back and forth, trying to persuade a jury, all of this stuff about like complex civil, like uh, corporate cry, uh, corporate, um, you know, civil crimes and all of that stuff. And like minor crimes in the UK is also just a judge. Um, but I don't know. Here where I live in Czech Republic, it's also just judges. There's no juries. And I don't know. If it was a murder trial, I'd, I think I'd like a, what do they call it? Like a collection of your peers, a group of your peers, rather than a, the one single judge. I mean, and then appeals judge and stuff deciding your fate. That feels pretty intense. Still, a murder conviction must be proven beyond all reasonable doubt. That statement is true in the Philippines as well. So what are some of the things that might constitute reasonable doubt? Well, starters, well, for starters, how about an alibi? We're going to blow through most of these pretty quickly because, as I previously stated, the trial was really all about Peiko, but it's still important to note that other men did have alibis. On the night of July the 16th, the two Yu brothers were celebrating their father's 50th birthday. All of the party guests placed them at the event until at least 11.30pm, 90 minutes after the abduction of the Cheong sisters. They did not leave the home until 7 a.m. the next day to go to the school. That's just testimony of friends and family, though, so maybe not the most ironclad alibi. Alberto and Ariel were seen at an auto mechanic with Alberto's wife and another couple at 7.30 p.m. The group returned to pick up the car the next morning, so there were witnesses to their whereabouts. They did not have their car, and there was no mention of a big happening or party made. Jossman and some friends had dinner at his house that night, then went to BAI Disco. They met up with some other friends, got increasingly drunk, and then went to a second bar. Jossman did not arrive home until his friend dropped him off at 3 a.m. I cannot find any information on Rowan's alibi, so either he didn't have one or it was just more friends and family. Regardless, it all came down to Peiko. Peiko's case was presented first as he was believed to have the strongest alibi. That alibi was that he wasn't even on the island of Cebu on the night of the 16th, which is a pretty bold claim to make and would require some serious proof. Proof that he absolutely had. Wait, all of these guys seem to have absolutely rock-solid alibis. 
Attendance records showed that Peiko was in attendance at his classes at the Center of Culinary Arts in Quezon City and that he took his midterms on campus the following day. He and his friends hung out at the r r bar in Katapunan. Uh, there were photographs taken that night that showed Peiko in the bar, but the judge felt the photos were tampered with because Peiko was not looking directly at the camera and his chair seemed to be a different color than the others. Remember, this was the late 90s, so these weren't exactly easily photoshopped digital pictures. They came from a roll of film. Something for sure is going on here. And I just want to know what it is. Jesus Christ. Um, yeah, these guys seem to have like watertight alibis. The logbook from Peiko's condominium recorded him as arriving home at 10.15 p.m., which the security guard attested to. The judge felt his entry had been added in afterwards. It was written in the uppermost portion of the book, sandwiched between two entries recorded at 10.05 p.m. There is no photograph of this logbook available, so the term sandwich could mean two different things. Either it could be in small print inserted between two entries, or it could be a normal entry and either he or the person after him was off by 10 minutes when they wrote down the time. If it's the former, then that part is a little peculiar, but I don't know that it's beyond a reasonable doubt levels of peculiar. Also, if there's... Oh, I guess so the logbook was available during the trial or whatever. Um, but given that we don't really know much about it, I just have to disregard this. There's also the matter of sworn affidavits from witnesses all testifying that Peiko was in Kazon on the night of the murder. In total, there were 45 sworn statements from classmates, friends, and teachers attesting to Peiko's whereabouts on the night in question. And all 45 of those people can't be bought, and they certainly aren't going to all like be his best friends. If it's family and stuff providing you an alibi, instantly let's be suspicious of that alibi but if i was at school and they were asking was this kid there even if i thought that kid was a dick and i didn't like them at all i'd be like yes they were there they're not guilty of murder i don't want them going to prison or being hung or hanged or whatever you want to say like yeah they were there this is crazy these are like rock solid the judge ruled that these statements had no merit, and when the defense began calling the witness to stand, the judge to the stand, the judge cut off their testimony on account of there being too many witnesses. Judge, who is paying you? B he also refused to allow Peiko to take the stand to defend himself. This is not okay. Speaking of witnesses, how about that Russia guy? It's pretty good. Wait, who's the Russia guy? It's pretty convenient that 10 months after the crime, he voluntarily gave himself up to the police. Oh, the, the, the star witness who got immunity. Uh, against his seven friends in exchange for blanket immunity, despite never having been implicated in the crimes at all. Isn't it funny how the world works sometimes? But actually, who was davidson russia the media was determined to spread the narrative of the chiong seven being drug addicted gang members and felon the eighth man russia was a drug addicted gang member and felon russia had served two prison sentences in the united states his confession had not come entirely out of the goodness of his own heart either and i'm not just talking about the offer of blanket immunity so he's been given something in exchange for this because you need the blanket immunity because otherwise you're going to go to prison but he must have got something on top of this because otherwise, why would he do it all together? I mean, he could have been threatened, he could have been bribed, something... I'm not sure. Immediately, I'm beginning to put together the pieces on this. I'll get to the bottom of this. And it's like, okay, so the father of one of the, uh, of the murdered girl was going to testify against his boss, who was a drug lord kingpin dude, which don't do, and his daughter just happens to get murdered, and then there's this cover-up with all these people who seem to have rock solid alibis and a judge who seems well sketchy i'm like this 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 drug lord dude's like what's up with this in a story that was corroborated by other prison inmates who witnessed the events the police had gently and repeatedly coaxed a confession out of russia with their fists oh okay so they didn't bribe him they didn't threaten him, they just beat the shit out of him until he agreed to do it allegedly their lit cigarettes de delicately caressed his back and their loaded guns were aimed lovingly at his face Rusia was given the full vip treatment and showered with this sort of affection from the police until he freely decided of his own volition that he had to do the right thing and confess to his horrible crimes this is so immoral 
During the trial, I mentioned that the prosecution questioned Rusia for days, but Peiko's team of defense lawyers only cross-examined him for 30 minutes. What I left out was that Judge Acampo only allowed them to cross-examine him for 30 minutes. Rusia gave a very detailed account of the events that happened starting at the mall and ending at the ravine, but in his story, Jacqueline left the ravine with them. He never said anything about what happened to her after, and the prosecution didn't ask. On cross-examination, when Rusia was asked what happened to Jacqueline, he fainted. But witness or not, the show must go on. Judge Akembo had the proceedings continue, and he answered questions on behalf of the unconscious witness. This is insanity. The judge is answering the questions. This is a can- this is a clown court. To say that this was an orthodox decision would be putting it lightly, but Judge Acampo was apparently a pretty unorthodox kind of guy. You know what I like in my judges? F***ing orthodoxy. The entire trial was a carnival. It was disorganized, and people shouted and spoke out of turn. Judge Acampo either didn't have the energy or the will to keep any semblance of order in his courtroom. I'm going to guess that he didn't have the energy, as he was occasionally catching a quick nap during the proceedings. Much like a witness fainting, the judge sleeping was not cause enough to pause the trial, so hopefully nothing important was presented while he was in dreamland. If anyone needs to go to jail, it's this judge. He's an absolute clown. So, we've talked about the Cheong Seven's alibi as one of the things that can be used to establish reasonable doubt. So what about the evidence in the trial? Surely there must have been a preponderance of evidence tying the accused to the crime, right? Actually, there was none. Aside from Rusia's account of events, there wasn't any actual physical evidence to tie any of the men allegedly involved to the crime. There was Marijoy's body, but we'll get to that in a moment. As the entire prosecution hinged on Rusia's testimony, there's one thing that we need to mention about his story. There were witness statements to corroborate Rusia's story of what happened that night. We mentioned one witness earlier, Annie, who signed a statement saying that she'd heard noise and saw the white car parked by the ravine. The thing with this statement, though, is that she claims it's a complete and total lie. And also, she's the only one? There were like 45 guys in class with this guy, not to mention all of the other crazy amounts of alibi evidence. Annie's account of that night was that she heard some noise or traffic outside, but she thought absolutely nothing of it. The following day was a market day, so it was common for people to drive by or transport their livestock. After being interviewed by police several times, they presented her with an affidavit to sign. The document that they presented the poor and uneducated woman was in English which she couldn't read. Uneducated but not stupid, she demanded that the officers translate the letter before she signed it. The police were honest men, so they agreed to translate the letter for her, but only after she signed it. They did tell her what the statement actually said, but when she argued to them about it being a lie, they unsurprisingly weren't interested. They got what they came for, so off they went. This is insane. I can't believe how insane this is and that this is a real story. If this was fiction, I'd be like, this is completely unbelievable. It would come out after the trial that most of the witness statements were from people who did not understand what they were signing, as the Cebuano speaking witnesses were all handed statements written in English to sign. There were also several statements testifying that seven men had abducted the Cheong sisters, and the addition of the eighth man as a star witness did not seem to raise any doubt surrounding the veracity of those statements. Speaking of the police interviewing witnesses, they did not interview a single one of the defense's witnesses to try to corroborate any of the accused men's alibis. They had met in custody, and it's their only job to make arrests, not to make correct arrests. Oh my lord, this is mental. Finally, let's talk about Marajoy's body, maybe. A body was found at the bottom of a ravine. That part's not up for debate. But was the body actually Marajoy? Well, didn't her parents identify her body as... Didn't we say that we had this discussion earlier, that her parents identified the body? Her parents identified the body as hers, and that was the end of it. Some fingerprints were taken that allegedly matched her prints on her voter ID card, according to Inspector Egua- e- Edgardo Lenizo, an inspector for the same police force that had allegedly beat a confession out of Russia. Ah, I mean coast. <laughs> They gently coaxed him into doing the right thing. Getting fingerprints from a decomposing body is difficult, and there was a lot of doubt about the authenticity of his claims. Thelma refused to allow any other forensic testing done on the body, so the identity of the girl was entirely the word of the parents. Normally I would say that a parent's verification is a pretty solid way of identifying a body, but normally the person in question didn't go missing after one of those parents agreed to testify against an alleged drug lord in a case surrounded by more questions than answers. 
The post-mortem examination did reveal one other crucial piece of evidence, that there was a stain on the deceased girl's underwear which testing showed matched Peiko's DNA and only Peiko's DNA. I hate to remind you, Simon, Mara Joy was allegedly raped by seven men, and Peiko is neither the first nor the last in the order Rusia gave. With seven guys, it's definitely possible that one of them is sterile, four of them, there's an outside chance, but six? I'd like to see that happen. Um, well, hang on. If he did rape her, how could he be in the on the other island or whatever at the same time? So again, I think either all the people are wrong. I mean, this is or they. This is very strange. It's either made up or maybe he assaulted her or they had sex because weren't weren't they? dating or something he, she's, he said that their parents said they were harassing or, and, and dating which was a weird phrase and now I'm thinking back on it so maybe that's how that happened but this is very strange the sample that was tested did show Peiko's sperm, but there was only one sperm cell, and no, none for anyone else. How can the prosecution claim that the girl was repeatedly raped, yet there is only a single sperm cell as evidence? Also of note is that the forensic expert who tested the sample admitted he was not wearing gloves at the time. For a scientist, I'd expect a little bit more care to be taken. Yeah, how about, as a forensics person, wear some f***ing gloves? All the supposed forensic evidence, of which there was honestly very little, was handled extremely poorly. DNA samples were handled without gloves, dubious fingerprinting, and all of the girl's clothing had just been shoved together into a single plastic bag. The defense quite reasonably wanted all of the forensics to be tested again due to the questions and doubt surrounding this handling of evidence. Judge Acampo denied this request, because of course he did, um, ruling that proof of the deceased girl's identity was irrelevant. I mentioned earlier that the defense lawyers quit the case because they were unable to provide any sort of reasonable defense, and they did. Now you know they were unable to provide a defense not because the accused men were so extraordinarily guilty, but because exculpatory evidence like an airtight alibi was thrown out by the judge, while questions of who this girl they found in the ravine actually was, and if the Cheong sisters were even raped or murdered at all, was ignored as irrelevant. Wow, that's crazy. So those lawyers didn't leave. They were just like, we can't work in this system. This is crazy. The judge clearly biased. It's insane. We quit. Poor client, though. Jesus. When the lawyers announced they would, would, would withdraw from the case on the basis that Judge Acampo was not running a fair trial, he became furious. How dare these six high-paid lawyers call into question the integrity of a judge whose decision-making and nap schedule are questionable at best. Utterly incensed, Judge Acampo threw the lawyers in jail for contempt of court and assigned lawyers from the Public Offender's Office. Yes, in the Philippines they call it the Public Offender's Office, not the Public Defender's Office, despite also having the alleged stance of innocent until proven guilty. I have to say, when I saw Public Offenders earlier, I just assumed it was a cut type from Kevin, so I reread it as public defenders. But wow. <laughs> oh, and these new public lawyers better hurry up and get to court because they were expected to continue with the trial the very same day. This is absolute madness. This is absolute madness. Ultimately, when it came time for the ruling, Judge Acampo determined that it could not be proven that Peiko wasn't in Cebu on the night the Cheong sisters disappeared, a statement that was only made true by the judge throwing out all the proof that Peiko wasn't in Cebu that night. There were four flights to Cebu on the night in question that Peiko could have theoretically taken if he wasn't busy being photographed at a bar, and even though there is no record from the airlines of him on any of those flights and representatives from the airlines testified that no one saw him, that wasn't good enough. The fact that there was evidence Peiko flew to Cebu the night after the murder, indicating that there would have also been evidence if he had flown there the night before, was deemed irrelevant. This seems like the judge, it's just working completely the other way around. This seems like guilty until innocent beyond all reasonable doubt. And I would say they even have enough evidence here for innocent beyond all reasonable doubt. Like, I don't think right now in this story there's any anything in my mind that says this guy's guilty. Anything. Maybe a little. But there is we are so far from reasonable doubt. We are so far beyond that. I'd say the chances of this be guy being guilty are tiny. The aftermath. Following a job well done, all of the prosecutors and police involved in the case were given promotions. Brilliant. You may now be wondering how Judge Acampo could live with himself after running such a sham of a trial. Well, good news, he couldn't. On the 7th of October 1999, five months after the end of the trial, hotel staff found Martin Acampo dead at his room at the Waterfront Hotel. 
There was a suicide note beside him, and his wrists and ankles had been slashed, along with a gunshot wound to his temple. Immediately, the National Bureau of Investigation opened probed into this event, as neither they nor the police believed this was a suicide. There was doubt as to whether the handwriting was really his, and the method seems more than a bit excessive for a suicide attempt. Why go through the trouble of slitting your wrists and ankles and then just shoot yourself afterwards? A camper had been receiving countless death threats from citizens angry over the verdict in the case of the Cheong Seven. How could this judge have sentenced these seven men to life in prison when clearly they deserved the death penalty? Oh no! Everyone's been terribly misled. The general public was outraged at such a lenient sentence. Eventually, the death was ruled a suicide. President Estrada, family friends of Thelma Chiong, echoed the public sentiment, stating that his death is a big loss, although I would say that his decision, since it was rape with murder, should have been a death sentence. It's important to remember that at this point in time, the public was not yet aware of what a ridiculous joke the trial had been. It's also important to note that President Estrada would resign a uh, little more than a year after this event following charges of gross corruption. Upon leaving office, he would be tried in court and sentenced to permanent imprisonment. Whoa, holy sh! I had no idea. They sent the ex-president to prison for life? Fair enough. I can't believe I don't know this. That's wild. That he must have been crazy corrupt. Despite the name, it's not so much permanent as it is exactly 40 years, but unlike life imprisonment, there is no chance of parole or pardon until at least 30 years have been served. No pardons? What if the person decides that he's innocent? That's mad. Despite his blanket immunity in the case, Rusia was still imprisoned at the place he had given his completely voluntary confession for other unrelated crimes. Thelma Chiong referred to him in the press as a gift from God, given that his testimony was the prosecution's entire case. She was seen visiting him multiple times in prison and even brought him a cake on his birthday. I understand how important his testimony was, but maybe don't bring a birthday cake to someone who claimed in open court to have raped your daughter. I'm not a mental health professional, and I can't speak to how normal a reaction something like this might be, so I asked one of my friends who is, and their response was, and I quote here, F to the no. Thelma, you are suspicious AF. Oh my god, are you ever. Leading up to the trial, Pego had considered fleeing the country. As a dual citizen of Spain, it would have been extremely easy for the family to pack up and go, but they all felt it was best if they stayed to clear his name at trial. Oops a daisy. Given this disgusting miscarriage of justice, there was only one logical step that the family could take next. The Appeal No one was happy with the outcome of the trial, and everyone involved appealed the decision. The convicted men naturally appealed on the grounds that their constitutional rights had been violated given the unfair nature of the trial and that none of them were allowed to speak in their own defense. It took five long years of waiting, but finally the Supreme Court made its ruling on February the 3rd, 2004. The appeal was won. Six of the seven men would be sentenced to death. Oh no, it was won by the prosecution. Oh, good lord. The other would remain in prison on two life sentences because he was a minor at the time the crimes were committed. Oh, and when I said the appeal was won, I meant the Chiang's appeal to upgrade the absurdly lenient sentence. The Supreme Court rejected the appeals of the convicted, convicted men. Oh, no. By this point, Rusia recanted his testimony, saying that the police had tortured him to confess, showing the bruises they inflicted upon him. The Supreme Court ruled that they could not throw his testimony out because there were other witnesses that corroborated parts of the story, even if those witness statements were signed by people who did not understand anything that was written on the English documents they signed. To further corroborate Rusia's story, were paid for their testimony, but I'm sure that's as immaterial as all the other evidence in this case. Apparently so, because the system is rigged against these people against the, the defendants. The court decision read, These cases involved the kidnapping and illegal detention of a college beauty and her comely and courageous sister. An intriguing tale of ribaldry and gang rape was followed by the murder of the beauty queen. This is a... What are you, what are you writing? I understand that judicial decisions are frequently overly editorialized and typically focus, but typically focus on the character of the parties involved and the significance of the evidence, not on how hot the victims were. It's time for another fun fact that is unrelated to this case and couldn't possibly have anything to do with anything. One of Thelma's relatives was Supreme Court Chief Justice Hilario David. It sure is a small world. He allegedly took no part in this decision. A statement that I absolutely believe, considering how dutifully and above board everything else in this investigation and trial was. Mm hmm. <laughs> allegedly. Give up tomorrow. 
After the initial trial, the general public was out for blood. They felt the convicted men needed to be executed and that Judge Acampo failed to do his judge only failed to do his job by only giving them life in prison. Shockingly, when the new verdict was released in 2004, the country was flooded by a massive wave of support for the young men. More and more information had come out on the case, the trial, and the incomprehensibly massive amount of corruption in the legal system. Pago's family pled their case to Spain and Amnesty International. Activists collected signatures on Pago's behalf and brought a petition signed by nearly 300 thousand Spanish citizens to the Philippines embassy in Spain. In, large di- in a last-ditch effort, Pago's lawyers, real ones, not the ones from the public defender's office, submitted his case to the United Nations Commission on Human Rights. The UN Commission called for his release, and the Spanish government requested clemency. President Gloria Arroyo, not a family friend of the Chiongs or a person who was convicted on corruption charges, promised that Pago's life would be spared. In a shocking turn of events, a politician kept a promise, and President Arroyo abolished the death penalty in the Philippines in June 2006, re- effective retroactively. The Chong Seven were not free men, but they were no longer ca- condemned to death. Excellent. Pecos family in Spain worked alongside the group Fair Trials International, a group dedicated to working on behalf of people who face a miscarriage of justice in the country other than their own. It took 12 long years in prison, but in September of 2009, Peco was finally going to be returned to his home country of Spain. Thelma tried her hardest to prevent the transfer, but it was one woman against the world. Perhaps she could have succeeded if she dedicated more time to this endeavor and less to bringing presents and birthday cakes to her daughter's supposed rapist. Once back in his home country, Peco was immediately sent to prison. What did you expect? They said he could come home, not that he was pardoned. Peco's family felt this was just the first step in finally seeing their son's freedom, and it very well could have been. Yeah, also, I'd rather be in, like, I don't know. I don't know Philippine prisons in particular, but, like, Asian prisons, they just seem like hellholes. And I'm sure Spanish prison is no picnic. But tell you where I'd rather be in prison. Europe rather than Asia. (laughs) Wise choice. Got views of the mountains down to the lake. And it very well could have been. The Spanish Prison Review Board agreed to recommend Peco for parole so that he could continue his life out of jail, but there was just one condition. He had to admit his guilt. His guilt to a crime that, by literally all accounts except for David's and Russia's, it would have been impossible to commit as he was 300 miles away from the island of Cebu. Needless to say, Peco refused and is still serving his life sentence in Spanish prison. I have a feeling Simon and I might disagree on this one. But I get it. You get that offer two or three months into your prison sentence, and sure, you'll say whatever they want you here to get, whatever they want to hear to get out of hell as fast as possible. Prison's a scary place, but after already surviving 12 years in jail for a crime you didn't commit, by that point, I really think walking out a free man would not seem nearly important as walking out an innocent man. Nah, Kevin, I kind of get it. Like Jesus Christ, this is a can you? That decision is so intense. But when was this? This was like. Uh, I'm sorry, 2009? So around 2009, something like that. So he's still been in prison for another 12 years after that. He's been in prison for like a quarter of a century. This is madness. Absolute madness. Public opinion has also continued to lean further towards the side of Peiko and the Cheong Seven. While the case was an immensely important event, even in the Philippines, it was largely unknown across the world. That changed in 2011 when American director Michael Collins premiered his documentary Give Up Tomorrow at the Tribeca Film Festival. The film would go on to screen at 75 festivals in over 40 countries and win 18 major awards, as well as receiving a theatrical release in Spain. Give Up Tomorrow centered around Peiko and his family and showcased the ridiculously corrupt nature of the story that we've disclosed today. The film's title comes from something that Peiko says in an interview related to the possibility of committing suicide in prison. I always tell my co-inmates, if you want to give up, which is normal, if you want to give up, give up tomorrow. When tomorrow comes, then I'll give up tomorrow. Tomorrow comes, I'll give up tomorrow. Thelma Chiong, who at this point I think we can all say is an unrelenting fuck, was once again outraged that this movie could exist, so she decided to fight fire with fire. Thelma commissioned her own movie, Jacqueline Comes Home, to be made from the perspective of her daughters rather than the alleged murderers. Her take was a true revisionist history, with most of the movie centering around what awful and violent people the Chiong Seven were. But not Davidson Rusia. He was portrayed as a kind person whose conscience left him no choice but to come forward and confess the guilt of himself and his friends. 
Jacqueline Comes Home was released in 2018 to much less acclaim than Give Up Tomorrow. Maybe it is. Maybe it was because the movie was blatant propaganda. Maybe it was because it was revisionist history. Or maybe it's because it features a scene where Thelma Chiong has a conversation with God, not a prayer. Oh, no, no, no. A dialogue. <laughs> Six years after Rose's arrival in Spain, Faker was downgraded to a third-degree felon, the classification for the least dangerous criminals. This allows him certain privileges, such as leaving the prison to go to school and work. He continued his culinary studies and has a part-time job as a chef. In 2019, three members of the Jiang Seven were released from prison in the Philippines on the Good Conduct Time Allowance Law. Thelma threw a fit, at which point it was announced that their release was a mistake and they were to turn themselves back into the authorities. President Rodrigo Duarte held a press conference stating an ultimatum. The three men had 15 days to surrender themselves or else the public could hunt them down at a price of 1 million pesos, roughly $20,000 per head, dead or alive. Oh my god, Duarte. He's the one who throws people out of helicopters, right? Allegedly. That's in that yeah. Dude, dude. As expected, the men surrendered themselves back to custody. I miss President Arroyo. She was way cooler. Yes. Yes. I've got a riddle for you, Simon. When is a murder not a murder? When the alleged victim is alive and well in Canada? Well, that's the theory, anyway. With Give Up Tomorrow reigniting interest in the case and bringing it to the world's attention, internet sleuths immediately got to work. If both girls were murdered, there should be a report of a second body somewhere, or if Jacqueline was kidnapped but alive, perhaps there would be evidence of a whereabouts somewhere in the world. The evidence people found came from the most shocking source, Thelma Chiong's Facebook page. In 2017, now-deleted Facebook posts from a family wedding in Canada showed two women who people felt looked exactly like Jacqueline and Mara Joy. When people caught wind of this, two users who claimed to be friends of Thelma said the girls were 100% alive and well. There are innumerable photos of the two women believed to be Jacqueline and Mara Joy, and I have to admit, the resemblance is uncanny. I'm looking at these photos, Jen, I'm sure we'll put them on the screen now. And I mean... I'm not very good at this, but there's definitely a super resemblance. In this image, Mara Joy is on the left and Jacqueline is on the right. The official story is the women and their... The official story is the women are their younger sister Debbie on the right and their brother's wife on the le left. This is the official story that has been presented, but many people are not buying that explanation at all. There are many, many more images of their modern selves available, even if the family has tried to remove them all from the internet, which is suspicious in and of itself. Yes. Something rather notable is that at the wedding of allegedly Debbie, alleged drug lord Peter Lin and his family were in attendance. I guess Lin and the Cheongs were somehow able to patch things up despite the whole testifying against you in court mess they almost got into. It's nice to see old friends reconnect, and that's never at all suspicious. It would be easy to dismiss these claims from Western internet detectives on the basis that they're not the same race and a falling victim to the they all look the same to me trope, an actual psychological phenomena every person is victim to, though to varying degrees. Fortunately, a number of Filipino people chimed in on the subject as well. A very, very large number of Filipino people. I, can, I can't say with any degree of certainty that there's a consensus among them on whether these uh, whether these absolutely look like the missing girls or not, but the percentage of Filipinos claiming that these pictures are clearly Marajoy and Jacqueline is an order of magnitude higher than what you would expect from a run-of-the-mill conspiracy theory. The theory that the Cheong sisters are alive and well in Canada has yet to either be proven or disproven to many people. The debate is, once again, Thielma Chong versus a preponderance of evidence, but without the women coming forward and admitting it, I'm sure there's not I'm not sure there's anything that can be done. For their sakes, it would be nice to think that these two women, both married with families, are the Cheong sisters and they're alive and well. But for the sakes of the Cheong Seven, luckily this is the casual criminalist, it's not our job to solve deep moral dilemmas like this one. This is such an intense episode. Like, I don't know, I'm pretty sure that those guys are, are innocent. The weight of evidence and the joke of a court that was their, that was their courtroom is it's just mad. It's extremely hard to remain neutral in a case as controversial as this, and it's clearly obvious that I didn't even try to. If you disagree with my assessment and think that these men deserve to die, well, I hope you burn in hell, but be sure to get in the comments and let me know. <laughs>
Right at the beginning, things weren't adding up. Two girls disappeared from a mall. This happened as the girl's father was set to testify against an alleged drug lord, and immediately after they disappeared, he chose not to testify. Originally, the story was that seven men had kidnapped these girls. Then, when it was convenient, it suddenly became eight men. The eighth man was a drug addled convict who was beaten into a confession that he later recounted. At the trial, prosecution witnesses were paid to speak, and defense witnesses were not allowed to testify, nor were the defendants themselves. The judge, when he was awake, kept no semblance of order in his courtroom. He testified on behalf of a faint, fainted witness and imprisoned the defense attorneys for very accurately insulting his integrity and the integrity of the trial. A few months after the trial, he was found dead in a hotel room in an apparent suicide. The evidence presented in court beyond the coerced confession was basically non-existent. What little forensic analysis was done was grossly mishandled and alibis were ignored. From start to finish, the trial was a complete and total disaster and a miscarriage of justice. One theory that circulates, and the one that I find by far the most likely, is this. The Cheong sisters were kidnapped by Peter Lim's hired goons to keep De Dionysio from testifying. When a Jane Doe was found at the bottom of the ravine, it was seen as an opportunity. The Cheongs identified her as their daughter, then refused any testing on her. Now that the girl's disappearance could be claimed as a murder, corrupt police officers were free to round up children of Lim's enemies with juvenile records to teach the families a lesson. We already know as a fact that the men that came to arrest Peiko were in fact Lim's goons, goons with expired police badges. And I will just say that this is all Kevin's speculation, allegedly, um, what he thinks might have happened. And to that, I certainly have absolutely no comment. With the seven men arrested, they needed to build a case against them. Since there was fortunately no evidence to prove what actually happened to the Jiongs or the girl in the ravine, or at least no evidence about the girl in the ravine that wasn't mishandled and destroyed, they just needed the police to beat a confession out of some low-life criminal that was already behind bars. Judge Acampo was then paid off to ensure a proper verdict, allegedly in Kevin's opinion, though he sentenced the Cheong Seven to life imprisonment instead of death. After the trial, he either committed suicide out of guilt, was killed as punishment for not giving a death sentence, or was simply killed to tie up loose ends. With that matter resolved, and with Thelma's relative as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court to ensure the appeal would result in the death penalty they sought, Marajoy and Jacqueline were free to begin a new life in Canada, and the Cheongs and Peter Lim could be friends again now that they had proven themselves useful and trustworthy once more. On the surface, that would read like an absurd conspiracy theory, but with all the facts that are available about just how mismanaged the trial was and how corrupt the police were, not to mention family friend President Estrada, it becomes disturbingly realistic. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot. You, you just draw your own opinion, listener. That's, that's all I'll say. Hopefully someday the complete truth about this case will come out so we can know for sure what happened and justice can be done properly. Until then, I'll leave you with Pago's own words. I'd rather have the death penalty again than admit a crime I didn't do. This has been a dark episode and a weird episode and a... And we haven't, like, corruption doesn't come up as much as I'd think, old casual criminalist. And this sure is an interesting example, and I know how I feel about this. You can draw your own opinion, I can probably guess what it was. I mean, Kevin, <laughs> let us know his opinion pretty clearly. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for listening or watching, however you get the show. If you are enjoying listening to it, please do leave a review. Podcast reviews make a big difference, I like to see them come in. If you're on YouTube, uh, why not subscribe? Best of all, Maybe you'll go back and watch an old casual criminalist right now. That actually is more than subscribing, more than liking. If you go back in your video feed right now and find an old CC, a cash crim that you haven't listened to, and or watched, and watch all of that as well, that is the most helpful thing algorithmically for getting the show in front of more people. Fascinating, right? And I'll see you in the next episode.